So you, yes, you do you have a variation of the So we have the best of 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 and there's a thing, there's a thing lab as well. We've been doing it. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. We're starting to do it. Yeah. We're finishing it. Yes. Everything really, that's, that's our goal. Yeah. So hi everyone, uh, thanks for being here. Um, so we're happy to have uh, Dr. Bader uh, with us here. So Dr. Bader uh, comes uh, from Chicago to give us uh, this talk. He did his PhD uh, at University of Mississippi and then his postdoc with at Chrissy Holland at Cincinnati. Uh, he is very active uh, in our ultrasound community, medical ultrasound community. He's been, he's been you know, the, 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 the boss of biomedical ultrasound uh, at, at the Acoustical Society of America for a few years. Uh, and so he's, uh, he's, been, you know, he's instrumental in you know, keeping our community uh, uh, tight and alive. So thank you for that. And uh, we're looking forward to your talk on hysteropsy, which is, as you will see, a way to use ultrasound to do ablation. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. All right, so I, I am really pleased to be here in, uh, in part because when I left Chicago yesterday, it was under 20 degrees. Um, but I'm also very happy to be here today to talk about some of the work we've been doing in Chicago uh, with hysteropsy, which is an ablative form of focused ultrasound. Um, but what I hope to convince you by the end of the talk is that there's more utility for it than just simply destroying tissue and, and um, uh, breaking it down. Uh, so here's an outline of what we'll discuss today. First, what is uh, the mechanism by which histotripsy breaks down tissue? Uh, spoiler alert, it's, it's bubbles. Uh, the se in the second portion of the talk, we'll discuss means for image guidance for the therapy. It's, it's non-invasive, so having appropriate guidance is, is really critical. Uh, also sort of throw in there some of the work that we're doing to try to improve upon that uh, standard. And then finally, we'll discuss how does tissue respond to this mechanically ablative therapy. I'll talk about mechanical, you know, what we mean by mechanical later on. And we'll do this through the guise of two particular applications, deep vein thrombosis as well as neuroblastoma. And so, you know, Surgical intervention to remove malignancies has been around almost as long as humans have been recording it. So something like I mean, in ancient Egypt, there's, there's cases of, of performing surgery. I think even now that, that there are cases where that is predated. Um, but the, the goal for interventionalists and physicians has been to try to reduce, to use more minimally or non-invasive techniques to try to reduce the morbidity, mortality, uh, hospital stay, those sorts of things. And so that's where ablation comes in. So this is the application of energy within a tissue to render it biologically inert. Uh, and so there's a couple of different modalities which I've listed here that are currently being used. Uh, by and large, these rely on uh, either heating or cooling the tissue to a, a certain point where we are, are killing the cells, destroying the cellular function. And so there can be limitations to applying either heat or, or, or cooling uh, tissues uh, and so that motivates the development of alternative, alternative energy methods to try to uh, cause ablation. And so one particular uh, uh, form of energy we can use is, is ultrasound. So it is, it is a mechanical form of energy. Uh, now I want to stress very much that ultrasound imaging in and of itself is, is safe. Uh, Maria and I actually sit on a different uh, committee that, that reviews that uh, sort of information on an annual basis. But it is still an energy modality, and we can exploit some of those properties. We can modify the way in which it's administered to cause therapeutic benefits. 
And so we'll, we'll rely on a, a another uh, waveform of, of energy that we are familiar with, optical energy. I'm sure that we've all used a magnifying glass to focus down light waves to a very small point, and in that point we can do things like burn leaves and that sort of thing. Um, and so what that means is instead of using a diagnostic probe like this, we could use some sort of lens to focus the sound waves down to a very small point. And an example of that's shown here. So on the left-hand side is a uh, spherically focused source. You can think of this as like the acoustic equivalent of one of these lenses. And here we're administering ultrasound pulses in a tank of, uh, this is degas water. And in this focal region, which is the, the sort of blue ellipse here, you see this intermittent flickering. And that's a spontaneous generation of bubbles within the tank of water. And so what's happening here is that the tension of the pulse is sufficient to take the, the water from its sort of native liquid state to transform it to generate this, this vaporous cavitation bubble phenomenon. And we know, so here this is a tank of degas water. We, we know because of the similarity in terms of acoustic properties between water and tissue that very similar things are happening in tissue and that's causing the breakdown of cells, the ablation of, of cells. And so that, that's demonstrated very nicely here. This is a, a, a study that was done by a colleague of mine, Eli Vlasovlevich, and apologies, Eli, for mis always mispronouncing your last name. Uh, but this is a, a series of high-speed images taken of a bubble cloud that was generated within, uh, this is a, a agros gel with a suspension of cells. And so this is sort of like a model tissue. And so you, as you can see, with the application of multiple pul pulses to a fixed location into this gel, uh, there's a different bubble cloud that's gener generated each time. But in the background, it becomes more and more optically transparent until at the end, what's happening is that the cells have broken down to the point where their, their optical properties have changed such that this is now optically transparent. And so this phantom is considered ablated. So we've, we've completely decimated the cells. Uh, now, because this is an MAE audience, I'm going to just warn you occasionally. I'm going to show a couple of gross uh, broken down tissues. I'll try to give you a warning, and this is your warning for this next bit. Um, so these are, so that, that was, I was showing an example of in a gel, what happens in actual tissue. So these are, are tumors that were formed on the flank of a mouse. This is a squamous cell carcinoma uh, tumor. And so we've, we've ablated them in, in both of these, these cases. And so what you can see on the left-hand side is that there's, there's a very nice ablation zone, this, this degradation of the cellular component that's surrounded by viable tissue in, in, their, in the interleaving. So it's a very precise therapy. Um, now, this is, this is a case where we've, we've sectioned the tumor very well. Uh, everything remains more or less intact. Here we applied a little bit too much pressure when we were sectioning the tumor. And the, the portion of the, the tumor that was ablated was simply aspirated out. And so what I want to convey here is that there's this fundamental difference in terms of how, tumor, how tissue is broken down with this sort of mechanical work of bubbles versus thermal ablation. So in thermal ablation, there's, it's, it's essentially cooking tissue, protein denaturation, scarring, complete um, um, uh, eradication of the tissue. Whereas here, it's, it's more of a complete uh, liquefaction of the tissue. Everything's being broken down into essentially acellular debris. And so that's, that's the difference. And so uh, when you use focused ultrasound in order to, to generate bubbles, to mechanically ablate tissue, it's a, it's a therapy called histotripsy. Uh, for those of you who are Latin buffs, histo is soft tissue. Tripsy means breaking down. It's an analogous thing to lithotripsy used to, to break down kidney stones. As a um, sort of under-investigation therapy, it's been around for about 20 years now. Uh, it's been, been developed for a number of different malignancies, uh, clotting, tumors, fetal septal defects, so on, et cetera. Uh, what's been exciting you know, over the past, I would say, five to six years is that it started to transition from this preclinical modality that's being tested on the benchtop into clinical trials that are, that are either currently underway or, or are have been recently uh, recently completed. And I've sort of listed each of those uh, uh, clinical pa uh, pathologies that are being tested clinically over here. Uh, on the right-hand side, this is actually one of the commercial systems that's being tested right now. So this is a, a company called Histosonics that's developing the Edison uh, technology. This is the device that's being used to investigate liver tumors currently. Uh, we're actually one of the sites for this, this clinical trial. And so this was, this was our fa first patient. So you can see here the commercial device uh, uh, sort of being wheeled into place. This is a, actually a water bolus that's coupled to the patient in order to allow the uh, transmission of the ultrasound energy in, into the patient. Um, and so that, that was exciting to, to treat our, our first patient. 
So, you know, I've, I've posed this sort of mechanical form of ablation with bubbles as an alternative to thermal ablation. Where, where are the relative advantages and disadvantages? So in terms of advantages, it's, it's one limitation for thermally ablative therapies is that they are restricted to uh, tissues with poor perfusion. Uh, highly vascularized tissue, highly vascularized tumors uh, act as sort of a heat sink. It's, it's very difficult to heat them up. Histotripsy, it, it doesn't really matter because it doesn't rely on heating or cooling. It's, it's purely a mechanical effect. Uh, it's, it's effective in these sort of highly vascularized tumors. If you're trying to treat a, a clot or something like that in, in a vessel, it's, it's effective. Uh, it has very precise treatment borders. So the ablation is really restricted to the, the locations of bubble formation. So the, if you look at histologically at sort of the edges of the ablation zones, there's a very thin rim of, of completely liquefied and completely intact tissue. Uh, it's very specific to cells. So if you have a tumor that's encasing a, a uh, vessel or something like that, the, va the vessel tissue, uh, extracellular structure, really restricts bubble growth. So you get, don't get very very much uh, degradation of those types of structures. And so if you have this tumor that's sort of encasing a vessel, you can treat the entire thing without having to worry about um, damaging the vessel. Um, the bubble show up is very hyperechoic on a standard ultrasound image. Uh, and so you can use ultrasound imaging for guidance as opposed to something expensive or ionizing like CT or, or MRI. Um, and then the other thing is that it, it seems to be, at least in preclinical studies, and, and then in one of the patients that was treated in the clinical trial, induce an immune response. And so it may be that you could treat, if you have an extensive disease, like a multiple metastases of a tumor, um, you could treat one of them and potentially get a strong immune response throughout the body. Now, there are disadvantages as well, and, and a lot of times these disadvantages are really flipped for the coins of, of the advantages. So, as I said, it's, it's very specific to cells. It's not as effective at breaking down extracellular structures. So, a lot of pancreatic tumors tend to have a strong, uh, strong fibrous capsule, and so histotripsy is not going to be very good at, at breaking down those. Uh, there are a couple of groups trying to address that, but it seems to still be a very, very ineff inefficient approach. Uh, so, for thermally ablative therapies, there is this... It, there are long treatment times because as the tissue is heated, it gets distorted, and the, the heating has to be applied intermittently, which, which provides a relatively long treatment time. There's something equivalent to that for, for histotripsy, which is a cavitation memory effect, so this sort of preferential generation of bubbles at a fixed location in the tissue, which can cause sort of inefficient uh, breakdown, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, image guidance is tricky in deep-seated targets. Um, uh, the bubbles are not as hyperechoic. There's sort of a loss of signal. Uh, we're going to discuss that a little bit later. So while ultrasound imaging works good, it doesn't work perfect all the time. And the other big thing is that it's not proven in the, cl in the clinic. So thermally ablative therapies have been used for a number of years now, you know, thousands upon thousands of patients. Uh, for histotripsy, we've treated like 100 patients. So it's still, it's still in its infancy in terms of like how well does it really work. Now, uh, how are bubbles generated? So the, the thing with, with bubbles and cavitation in, in general is it's, it's, it's built as a very stochastic phenomenon. And so uh, during sort of the early stages of the development of histotripsy, there was a lot of fundamental research that went into understanding how do we make sure that we're generating bubbles with every single pulse. And so what you're looking at on the left-hand side here is this is the probability of generating cavitation as a function of the peak negative pressure of the histotripsy pulse. How much tension are we applying in order to generate bubbles? And so what you can see is that for, for tensions up to like around 20 megapascal, the, the likelihood of generating cavitation is essentially nothing. Um, and I should note that for most diagnostic imaging pulses, you're talking about you know, peak negative pressures of around uh, one megapascal here or something like that. So you're talking about a 20-fold increase in pressure. But beyond around 25 megapascal, the, the, the probability rapidly rises up to be about 100%. And so the, the point is to operate in this regime where you're, you're applying tensions on the order of 35 to 50 megapascal to ensure the generation of, of cavitation. And I should say this, this appears to be fairly consistent over a wide range of both um, sort of tissue mimicking mimic, mimic materials, ex vivo tissues, and in, really even in vivo, it seems like this is sort of the, the threshold regime uh, required to generate cavitation. And so how do we, so the, the point is to operate at really high pressures uh, to guarantee that cavitation is generated with each and every pulse. Bubbles are generated with each and every pulse. So how do we do this? So there were sort of two advances in instrumentation that were developed to, to accommodate this. And so this is 
uh, system that we've been developing for the treatment of, of venous clots. Um, you can see the different uh, uh, components here, but what I really want to focus on two. So the first is the histotripsy source. And so conventional, you know, focus ultrasound as a therapy has been around since like maybe the 50s or so with the Fry brothers and some of their, their uh, investigations into training uh, brain tumors um, and other neurological applications. So the F number for those types of, of transducers was somewhere on the in excess of one. And so in reference, the F number is, is the ratio of the diameter of the source relative to the focal distance. And so for histotripsy, what we found is that we need higher focal gain, which means we need to reduce the F number to below one. Now, in order to do that, in the past, you would typically go to a company like Sonic Concepts or Imasonics or something like that, and they had off-the-shelf sources that you would then try to apply to your system. Uh, with the advent of rapid prototyping, we found that we can develop sources very, very rapidly. So on the order of you know, a month or more, you can make a, a transducer. And you can do it very specific to whatever type of pathology you're trying to treat. So for instance, this is a source that's been developed specifically for venous thrombosis. So the, the diameter, the, the geometry of the source, the size of the focal lobe for the source, um, the output is, is sufficient to contain bubble activity within like the iliofemoral vasculature of the patient. So this is even fast enough where we think that um, while you could develop sort of a source that would work in general, you know, given um, um, sufficient imaging and input on the geometry of the patient, the vasculature of the patient, you could design patient-specific sources. If you had a patient that was maybe overly obese or, or uh, 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 particularly petite. So the first thing here is that we're developing a source that's, that's uh, uh, much more focused and very specific to pathology. So the second thing was the development of the driving electron. So in the past, usually Class A amplifiers were used because that had very low harmonic distortion. Uh, but the Class D amplifiers are very good for applying very high uh, outputs for very short duration. So here we're talking about something like 20 kilo kilowatts peak power, but over something like a 1 to 20 microsecond duration. So the, the point is to have that really, really high intensity, uh, but over a relatively uh, short amount of time. Um, so moving on now to, to image guidance. So the, the, again, this is the commercial device. If you sort of zoom in towards the source, which is shown here, um, this is an image not of this transducer, but our transducer, but it, it's the same thing. Uh, you can see that there's this coaxial uh, probe in the source, the imaging probe. And so the point is that ultrasound imaging can be used to detect these hyperechoic bubble clouds to ensure that you are, are targeting what you want to target. Um, an example of that's shown here. So this is a uh, clot that we are treating. Uh, so you can see this sort of vessel, the clot is right here. And as I play this image, and you'll see this sort of intermittent flickering that's occurring. And that's the, that's the confirmation that you're generating bubbles within the clot. Now, if I pause this and I were to ask you to point out where the bubbles are, I don't know if anybody can really do that, but you have a, a better eye than I do. Um, and it, that's kind of been one of the, I don't want to exactly say dirty secrets, but um, kind of something that a number of us have been very unsatisfied in terms of trying to use ultrasound imaging to detect these bubbles. That, that really what ends up happening is that you're looking at changes in intermittent changes in the speckle of the image to indicate cavitation and not something very strongly indicative of what's going on. And so that's motivated us to try to develop um, new methods to try to gauge the presence of cavitation, to try to quantify the amount of cavitation and determine how well that correlates with, with treatment outcomes. And so there are a couple of methods I'm going to talk about here. The first is, is acoustic emissions. And so during the insonation, as, as the ultrasound pulse is being applied, um, these bubbles expand, they collapse, and, they, 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 and that expansion and collapse, and collapse is what's responsible for causing ablation, breaking down the cells in the tissue. Those oscillations also produce acoustic emissions. So you can think of them as these bubbles as being sort of their own little speakers. And this, the intensity of those emissions are proportional to the mechanical activity, which is therefore what's responsible for ablation. And so in the past, you know, a number of groups have used something like a single element source to sort of detect those emissions in order to quantify them. Uh, more recently, there's been the development of arrays to try to, to triangulate the location of emissions. Uh, you can do this with a conventional diagnostic probe. And that this 
by detecting those emissions and then processing them in a very similar fashion to what you use for standard ultrasound imaging, you can form these maps of not only the location of cavitation, but what the strength of the emissions are at that particular location. An example of that shown here, so in the background here, this, this purple thing is a phantom that we've ablated. The sort of blue outline here is the extent of the ablation zone. And then the hot color map overlay is what we term a passive cavitation image or, or passive image of, of bubble emissions. And so the whiter it is, the stronger the emissions are at that location, and therefore the stronger the mechanical activity that's being generated. Uh, now, down below is sort of a, a look at that, this, these emissions through sort of a central slice of, slice of the lesion. So values of 1 indicate the, that the phantom has been uh, ablated, while values of 0 indicate that it's intact. And then the red line here is the amplitude of the passive cavitation image along that dashed blue line. And so what's sort of interesting here is that there seems to be a very well-defined threshold for the amount of acoustic energy associated with ablation. And so we may be able to use this as a gauge to say whether or not the treatment has been successful. And so a, a graduate student of mine a couple of years ago, Greg Anthony, did a comparator test where he said, how well does that, that threshold for passive cavitation imaging uh, do in terms of predicting the extent of ablation relative to other modalities. So here he was comparing uh, these emissions relative to uh, a standard uh, ultrasound image. So looking at the hyperacogenicity of the bubble cloud, he found that the, the emissions did uh, much better in terms of predicting the extent of ablation. Uh, he also compared it to other modalities visualizing the ablation zone afterwards, either with standard ultrasound imaging or a few different uh, modalities of MRI. And again, emissions had the best correlation with the overall extent of ablation. And so we're hoping to use this as, moving forward, we're hoping to try to develop these, these imaging uh, techniques as a means to try to uh, provide some sort of mechanical equivalent of a thermal dose. So thermal dose is a, there's a very well-defined relationship between heating cells and the degree of cell death. And so we're, we're hoping to kind of uh, move this sort of acoustic emissions as a mechanical equivalent of that. Okay, so that's, that's the action of bubbles during the intonation. They, they oscillate, they produce these emissions. Now what's really sort of interesting and, and also not very interesting about these hysteretripsy bubbles is that they also tend to stick around for a very long time. So after, that, after the excitation, they tend to persist for up to uh, hundreds of milliseconds. And we think this has to do with the diffusion uh, process. So as, they, they, as they're formed, a bunch of gas dumps in, and they slowly dissolve over time. This dissolution is kind of like, it's a very slow process. And so the point, though, is that those persistent bubbles end up having an impact on the treatment outcome. Um, so on the left-hand side is our, our, this is an ablation zone that was generated. Uh, so the white here is the ablation. At a, at a pulsing rate that is sufficient for the bubbles to dissolve between the application of pulses. In contrast, and you can see it's a fairly nice uniform ablation zone. In contrast, if you increase the pulsing rate by about two factor two orders of magnitude, the ablation zone looks a little bit more ratty. You can see these regions of intact cells within the ablation zone. And so what's happening here is that the persistent bubbles act to preferentially generate bubble activity at discrete locations in the focal zone. And so basically the ablation zone is, is non-uniform because you're not generating cavitation sort of spot or bubbles spontaneously throughout the ablation zone. And so that really motivates the development of active imaging techniques for these, these persistent bubbles because they, they really don't, they don't produce strong acoustic emissions. And so we need the active imaging to ensure that the bubbles are dissolved between the application of pulses to ensure maximal treatment efficacy. Again, this is a, and I apologize, I don't know why this image is so grainy, um, but this is a, a uh, active image or, or standard ultrasound image of a bubble cloud that is generated around a you know, five centimeter depth Again, if I didn't have this, this sort of label here, I think you'd be hard-pressed to say, okay, there's, there's a bubble cloud there. And so that's motivated us to try to move forward with uh, developing better imaging techniques that are very specific to bubble activity and also effective at depth. And so that led us to a particular sequence which is called chirp-coded excitation. So standard diagnostic ultrasound imaging uses relatively short duration pulses to retain good uh, axial resolution. chirp code coded excitation, in contrast, applies relatively long duration imaging tone bursts. And so the point is that the long duration allows the better detection, better scatter of from uh, structures at depth. 
Now, moreover, the, the, the frequency varying uh, wave also accentuates sort of bubble oscillation. So you, you anticipate to get stronger and stronger emissions from uh, scattered back from bubbles at depth. Now, in order to retain a good axial resolution, a mass filters are applied to the retained signal. So it's sort of like here, the, the, the bandwidth between a, a chirped imaging pulse and a standard imaging pulse are the same. It's just that the time and frequency at which the, each of the individual components is, is varying. So the match filter basically collapses that down, and so you essentially um, use this signal in terms in when doing the delay and sum beam forming process to, to form the image. Now the match filters can be modified to either accentuate fundamental signals. This would be something equivalent to a standard B mode image, or it can be used to accentuate bubble specific type of oscillation. So in particular, subharmonic frequencies. That is half of the bandwidth or half of the frequencies in the bandwidth of this chirp. Um, to really drive the, the presence of, of bubbles. And so I had an uh, undergraduate student a few years ago, Emily Wallach, who uh, investigated this uh, both with uh, sort of in vitro phantoms, scattering phantoms, as well as in vivo. Uh, and so this was, again, sort of our, our standard conventional B-mode image of, of the presence of a bubble cloud. Um, this was actually a, a, uh, one of the chirped imaging pulses, but with the fundamental match filter. But we found it was essentially equivalent to the standard uh, B-mode image. This was the uh, chirp-coded excitation sequence, but used to process subharmonic emissions. And so you can see the difference between these, these two images. So I, I should point out these are the same received data, it's just that they're being processed slightly differently. And so here, it's, again, it's very hard to distinguish the bubble cloud, whereas here, you know, it really starts to pop out from the background. And you can see you get about a three-fold increase in the contrast to tissue ratio in terms of detecting these bubbles. Now, uh, a colleague of mine uh, at uh, the Indian Institute of uh, uh, Gandhi Hinger, uh, Manchu Shakar, said, I think we can do even better. And so he ended up um, taking the same data, but adding in an extra layer of processing, which is called a Volterra filter. And so the Volterra filter further accentuates sort of nonlinear uh, detection of signals after the post-processing steps, or after the sort of um, the match filtering step. And so you can see here, we start to go from something where it's very difficult to detect the bubble to almost a, a tenfold increase in the contrast to tissue ratio. And so the, the point here, and, and again, all of this data, all of, all of these images are formed with the same received data, it's just the processing is different. And so the point is, we don't have to suffer through this sort of like malarkey where it's very difficult to see the bubble cloud. You can, you can process these in a way where it's, it's very evident to, to indicate the presence of cavitation. Uh, and if I'm using cavitation and bubbles here intermittently, they're, they're both kind of the same, but it's, it's hard to, to stick to one. All right, so now that we are very, we can detect these bubble clouds very well, what, what, what can we do with that type of information? And so on the left-hand side, what you're looking at here is the sort of normalized grayscale or the, the echogenicity of the bubble as a function of time. And so with sort of plane wave imaging, we can, we can track with very good temporal root resolution the dissolution of the bubble cloud over time. Now the point is that the, the, the dissolution rate is, is strongly dependent on the size of the bubbles. And remember, the, the whole point of, of histotripsy is that it's the mechanical action of bubbles that breaks down cells in order to, to cause ablation. And so if we know the size of the bubbles, we can therefore get some idea of the amount of energy that's imparted to the tissue. And so the, the, especially this initial dissolution rate is strongly dependent on the size of the bubbles. And we can, mod, we can fit that to known models to gauge the, the passive dissolution of the bubble over time, meaning that we can sort of fit it to this and try to extract this parameter, this r naught term, which is proportional to the, the size of, of the uh, bubble. And so that's what we've been starting to do. We've, we've been taking data sets like this. We've been fitting it that, to that equation. And so based off of the, the estimated dissolution time, we can therefore estimate the expansion of the bubble and therefore the amount of energy that was imparted to the tissue. And so that's an, an example of that shown here. So this is anywhere where you see a, a, a color map here. It's indicative of the dissolution time and then the corresponding estimated energy uh, imparted pixel-wise to the tissue. And so we've conducted some initial studies. So here we're looking at the um, amount of energy that was imparted to the tissue relative to the peak negative pressure of the histotripsy pulse. Uh, 
you know, incidentally, the, the peak negative pressure, the, the size of the bubble is roughly proportional to the peak negative pressure. And so, you know, we get some relationships here where there's, there seems to be an increase in the amount of energy that's imparted to the tissue. Um, this data is relatively new. We're still trying to figure out what this really means, how to, how to tie this to something um, that relates back to how the tissue is being damaged. But it, it's kind of an interesting observation that instead of doing something like passive imaging, which, which has its limitations um, and is not really a standard modality, we may be able to use sort of conventional ultrasound imaging and get similar type of quantitative metrics for the amount of energy that's being imparted uh, to the tissue. And so that, that's something we're, we're hoping to um, work on over, over time. All right, so now let's kind of transition to what is the response of tissue to this mechanical ablation? How does it, how does it uh, respond? And so we're going to do this again through the guise of, of two particular diseases, so deep vein thrombosis and neuroblastoma. Uh, so deep vein thrombosis is, is the obstruction of the venous return in the iliofemoral vasculature, so the legs of the vein. It's a fairly prevalent condition. It affects something like 5% of the population over the course of their lifetime uh, and has significant morbidity and mortality associated with it. So for clots that are, are particularly in, in the iliofemoral vascular, physicians will intervene because those have the highest propensity of embolizing to the pulmonary arteries, obstructing blood flow to the lungs. And that's an extremely serious condition if you get a pulmonary embolism. And so in that case, what physicians will do is administer a drug through a catheter-directed um, uh, device. And so in, the way that this works is you can sort of think of these clots as being bags of red blood cells held together by a fibrin mesh. And then what the drug does is it sort of cleaves the fiber and mesh to chemically dissolve the clot. There's any number, number of reasons we want to try to improve upon this. Uh, it's not, this therapy is not very effective if the clots are older. It does have a risk of bleeding complications. And so the development of adjuvant therapies is sort of an active area of research for this disease. So we envision histotripsy may be used as an adjuvant for, for this catheter-directed therapy. So we sort of think that by using histotripsy, we can sort of break down the cellular components of the clot, allowing better distribution of the drug and therefore better dissolution of the, uh, better resolution of, of the uh, treatment. And so we've done a couple of pilot studies, and, and what we see, the, the, the combination approach seems to work pretty well. So what you're looking at here are histological sections of clots either treated with the drug alone. You can think of this as sort of the standard of care. Uh, with histotripsy alone, you can think of this as, you know, trying to mechanically ablate the clot or the combination approach. And so the point here is that there's a lot less of the clot left over when you do the combination treatment relative to either of the, the treatments individually. And it, it's more just, than just sort of an additive sum. There seems to be some synergy between the two uh, treatments here. And you know, here this is qualitative. We've also done quantitative metrics, and we see that you know, it's definitely much more effective. And so what's, what's going on here? So we think that there are two mechanisms that are occurring um, simul simultaneously. So the first is hemolysis. So this is the breakdown of red blood cells within the clot by histotripsy bubble activity. So this is basically histotripsy being histotripsy, breaking down the cellular components of the target tissue. So the second thing mechanism is the action of the drug on the clot. And so the drug acts to break down the fiber mesh. And so the question that we had is, is how do each of these mechanisms contribute overall to clot degradation? And, and this is important because if one is being, being is, has a stronger contribution than the other, we want to, because this is still sort of a new technique, we want to try to design it or, or modify it in such a way that we can accentuate those strong properties to promote very strong, very effective clot degradation. And so a couple of years ago, my, my graduate student, Sam Henley, uh, conducted this study where he, an in vitro study where he would basically treat clots, collect uh, perfusate afterwards after the clots were treated, and then assay them for, mar for each of markers for each of those, those mechanisms. So in terms of hemolysis, um, that meant you know, breaking, lysing red blood cells, and when you lyse red blood cells, they, they release hemoglobin. And so he conducted a relatively straightforward color metric assay to quantify the amount of, of hemoglobin that hemoglobin that was present. In terms of fibrinolysis, uh, it turns out that the drug exit breaks down the fiber mesh in a very specific way. In particular, it, it degrades it to this particular molecule, which is the D-dimer molecule. This is actually a fairly standard biomarker for, for the presence of, of clotting in patients. And so we worked with our medical laboratory labs to, to quantify the amount of D-dimer that was produced. 
And so once he measured those two markers, he compared them to an overall metric of treatment efficacy, which in this case is the, the clot mass loss. So how much of the clot was present before treatment versus how much of the clot was present after treatment. And so what you're looking at on the ordinate for each of these figures is the amount of mass loss. So you know, think of that in your mind as how the overall treatment efficacy. And here he's correlating it with our markers of hemolysis, that is this hemoglobin, um, you know, breaking down the red blood cells, or D-dimer, the action of the thrombolytic drug on the fibrin mesh. In this particular case, he's got no lytic, um, and so what, you see very little of this D-dimer. In fact, all of these measurements are essentially in the noise board. Uh, I should also point out here, he did this over a range of exposure conditions to vary the amount of bubble activity. And so, again, there was no here there was really no correlation between mass loss and D-dimer because there's no breakdown of the fiber mesh. There's no drug. In contrast, there is a strong correlation between mass loss and hemoglobin. Um, now, in order to sort of quantify the, the relative relations, the, the thing that Sam did that I think was really interesting was to form this linear regression analysis. And so that that would involve taking the slope of each of these, these um, sort of relationships but normalizing the amount of hemoglobin or D-dimer using Z-scores. And so in the end, he was able to report a slope, which was indicated here in a beta value. And the point is that if there's a difference in the slopes between these two relationships, it means that one of the, the mechanisms is, has a stronger contribution to the overall treatment efficacy relative to the other. So in this case, the beta value for between mass loss and hemoglobin is significantly improved relative to mass loss and D-dimer, meaning that in the absence of the lytic drug, hem hemolysis, breakdown of the red, cells, red blood cells is the primary mechanism by which clots are broken down. In contrast, when you add in the lytic drug, you can see here there's a strong correlation between mass loss and both of these markers. And this was the part that was interesting. The, the slopes between these, these beta values between the two mechanisms were statistically significantly different. Statistically significant, insignificant. They were the same. They were the same. That's the point. And so what that told us, which, which was kind of, un, un, we were not expecting to find, is that both hemolysis and fibrinolysis were contributing equally to the overall treatment efficacy. Both of them were important. And this was in a sort of a qualitative agreement with observations we had on histology. So this is a uh, histological section of the, the whole section of the clot. You can see this sort of nice ablation zone here. Now, if you zoom in, there both cases when you had just histotripsy alone or histotripsy and lytic, there were nice ablation zones. The difference, though, was that in the histotripsy alone case, we had these swaths of fibrin that were left over meaning that structure was, was left behind. Whereas in contrast for the histotripsy and lytic case, the ablation zone was relatively free of anything. Now the point here, now this is important because the histotripsy alone case, it's possible to recanalize the vessel. You can create a channel through the clot, store, uh, flow can be re reinitiated. But the point is that this fiber mesh that's left over is thrombogenic meaning that a patient over time, even though initially the vessels recanalized, will rethrombose. Now, if you're a physician, you really don't like to retreat patients. If you're a patient, you really don't like to go to the hospital multiple times. And so what we think is the advantage of this combination technique is it's a means to address not only the cellular components of, of the tissue, but also the extracellular components, at least in the context of the clock. So meaning we can treat the entire tissue as opposed to just breaking down the cellular components. Now, the, the second thing that Sam did that is, is sort of second investigation was to understand how was the bubble activity, activity contributing to each of these mechanisms also. And so he used this passive cavitation imaging technique. So he, he formed these images to indicate the strength of emissions that were occurring in the clot and therefore the strength of the mechanical activity. And then he correlated with that with each of these metrics kind of in a similar type of analysis. So on the uh, abscissa here for both of these graphs, this is the radiated acoustic pressure, again, the, the intensity of bubble activity relative to the amount of hemoglobin or hemolysis or D-dimer, meaning fibrinolysis. Again, in this case, in the absence of lytic, there's no D-dimer, bubble activity is not contributing at all to breaking down the fiber mesh because we know it just is not very good at breaking down the extracellular structure. In contrast, there is a strong relationship between the amount of uh, radiated pressure and hemoglobin here and so in this case, most of the bubble activity is just going down to, to breaking down the cells within the clot. In contrast, when you add in the lytic drug, again, it's a very similar type of story. 
uh, significant relationship between emissions and either hemoglobin or D-dimer. And using a similar type of linear regression analysis, the slopes are, again, the same between these two markers. And so what that means is that the bubble activity is, is not, it, it's contributing to both of these mechanisms equally, which, which we were sort of kind of floored by and, and a little bit flabbergasted. And so in order to try to understand this, you know, why is bubble activity contributing to both of these, these markers equally, uh, we started to develop, to, I don't even want to say an in silico model, there's very little numerical calculations here, it's mostly analytic, but it's a, it's a theoretical construct, a, a model to try to gauge what's going on. And so this model has three parts. So prediction of ablation, uh, prediction of perfusion of drug throughout the clot, and then the action of the drug on the, on the clot. And so in the first portion, which is the prediction of, of ablation of the clot, uh, we used a Monte Carlo type of simulation. So this was developed by Adam Maxwell, I want to say a couple of years ago, but this is almost 10 years ago now. But given a known pressure distribution of the source and the probability of generating a bubble, you can sort of flip a coin. And if, there's, there's a, if it's energetically favorable, you can say a bubble will be nucleated at this point in the field. Now, the thing that Adam did um, is he assumed sort of a, a very uh, uniform, homogeneous background medium. We used annotated, for our computational space, we used annotated histological sections of clots that were extracted from venous thrombosis patients. And so what we did is it pixels where we, we allowed sort of site-specific um, restrictions on nucleation and bubble growth based on the proximity of where you say, okay, here I can generate a, uh, a bubble, but if there's fibrin or if it's nearby fibrin, we're going to say you're either suppressing nucleation or you're restricting the growth of the bubble. And so that results in um, sort of a, a non-uniform ablation zone, which is sort of shown here. So this is the pre with the, the um, uh, beam profile overlay. Here you see this region of ablation, but these, these swaths of fibrin which are left throughout um, the clot. Now the second portion in terms of assessing the distribution of drug throughout the clot, we used a uh, finite difference time domain solution, the perfusion diffusion equation. And so what this does is we say that um, regions of the clots where, that are intact, we model as a porous media. And so this effectively restricts diffusion and it's harder for the drug to distribute there. Whereas in contrast, regions where we've ablated, we've caused ablation, we assume again, because that we know from histology, these, these that those portions of the tissue are essentially liquefied, that you've got very good diffusion through that portion. And so what you're looking at here are our, those types of predictions. So the blue here is, is a catheter that's distributing the drug. In the case of the no hit, so the, in the color map overlay indicates the, the intensity of the drug distribution. In the absence of hysterotripsy, you can see this sort of radially symmetric um, sort of uh, asymptotic reduction of, of the distribution of the drug relative to the position of the catheter. In contrast, where you have histotripsy, um, this is actually for this particular ablation zone. You can see where regions where we have ablation, there's an increased diffusivity of the drug. And so it means that more of it is being distributed over a larger area throughout the target tissue. So once we know the distribution of drug, we can use uh, kinematics based off of kind of some known relationships between um, the, the sort of um, Aharinas equation to estimate the action of the drug as a function of the, co the, the breakdown of fibrin due to the constant local concentration of the drug and the time over which the drug is distributed. And so these are some, some initial results here. So the, the, again, the blue here is the catheter. The color map overlay indicates the concentration of D-dimer as a function of position. Um, you can see it's even in the no histotripsy case, it's not exactly uniform, but that's because we're using actual histological sections where there's sort of a... a um, non-uniform distribution of the, the fibrin mesh. Um, in contrast, you can see for the histotripsy section, there is a, a larger concentration of the dimer or the, the, throm the breakdown of the fibrin mesh over, over a larger area. And so as sort of our initial estimate of, you know, how well is this doing, we sort of summed up the amount of D-dimer that occurred in the no histotripsy case and compared it to the, rel to the case of histotripsy. And we found there was about a 1.5-fold increase in the amount of, of fibrinolysis that was occurring. Now, that was nice because in our, our prior study, in vitro studies, we found the exact same uh, increase in the amount of fibrinolysis that was occurring. And so what's kind of nice is that this seems to be a model that seems to be at least consistent with experimental data, provides you know, relative 
um, uh, relatively qualitatively and quantitative results that are similar to, to our data. And we're sort of hoping to use it um, here to uh, provide better predictions of, of um, treatment profiles and, and you know, uh, using sort of the equivalent of like a Monte Carlo simulation for radiation therapy. How do you use this information to provide the most effective and the, and the best treatment? All right, so that's what we've done uh, to date. We're moving forward. In, I showed a bunch of data for, for in vitro studies. We're moving forward with um, some in vivo studies as well. Um, and so we're developing this model, which is a porcine model of deep vein thrombosis. The model is initiated almost in the exact opposite fashion to the way that physicians try to treat clots. So we advance balloon catheters to the inguinal space of the, of the animal in the femoral vein, so it's roughly where the hip is. Uh, we then inflate those balloons and then inject a drug in order to induce clotting. And so this is a um, fluoroscopy image. You can see all the balloon catheters being advanced uh, in the femoral vein. Uh, this is an ultrasound image after we've um, initiated clotting. So the femoral vein is here. You can see this nice clot that's formed uh, within the vessel. Uh, we've started to do some initial tests of, of our, our um, equipment to try to see how well we can break down clots. Um, and so you can see here, this is my uh, graduate student, Joel, uh, and then Connor in, in the background here with our, our system uh, initiating, uh, trying, and this is just basically a water bath to couple the, the histotripsy source to the clot. Um, these are kind of some initial results here. So what you're looking at here, the top here is the skin of the animal. This is the femoral vein, which is uh, full of clot. And this sort of intermittent flickering here is, is the formation of bubble with, within the clot. And so afterwards, um, this whole region initially was clotted. Again, this is the femoral vein. This sort of darkening region is the indication of sort of um, liquefaction of the area. So we're able to at least treat a portion of the clot. We didn't treat the entire clot in this case because we were still, this is basically our first animal and we were trying to work out the logistics, but we were pretty happy that we were able to, to get to this point. Um, so to this point, we've been talking about how clot responds to histotripsy ablation. Um, I think the point is that you can, you know, with histotripsy, at least you, you debulk the cellular components. Clot is, you know, with a tissue sort of, um, but what, what about something like a more complex tissue, like a tumor? How does that respond? And so that, that brings me to a collaboration I've been doing with the Hernandez lab, uh, Sonny Hernandez, who's shown here, uh, in the Department of uh, Surgery. And she's primarily interested in neuroblastoma. And so neuroblastoma is the most common extracranial pediatric tumor uh, in, in the world. And so um, and it's sort of interesting. So half the kids, when they get neuroblastoma, you know, a year or two later, you would not even know they were sick. Half of them, though, basically they have high-risk disease, and, and it, it's a bit of a crapshoot whether or not they're going to survive. And so in those cases, they, they essentially throw everything in the kitchen sink at these kids to try to resolve the disease. So they... Um, uh, apply initially surgical resection to remove as much of the tumor as they can. This is followed by high-dose chemotherapy and radiation to treat residual disease, followed by immunotherapy. Despite that treatment regime, you know, roughly half the kids don't respond, and unfortunately they pass. Um, and so, um, you know, in, in, one thing I want to point out here is that normally this, the disease originates close to the kidney, not exactly, it's in the adrenal glands, which is pretty close to the kidney. So the point is, despite this intensive uh, re uh, treatment regime, you know, what is there something that we can do that's an adjuvant therapy? And so here we think histotripsy may actually address multiple aspects, either either replace or accentuate multiple aspects of this treatment. So the first is in terms of ablation, we can use it to debulk the tumor. So this would be in lieu of surgical resection. You don't have to put the kids under anesthesia. They don't have to, you know, undergo the, so, such an invasive procedure. Um, the second thing is improved delivery of therapeutics. We've shown in the context of at least thromboocclusive disease that we can improve the delivery of, of, to, for the treatment of clots. Seems like we should be able to do the same thing for chemotherapy. And then the fine thing is, final thing is immunosensitization. There's been preclinical studies that have shown there's an abscobble effect where basically you have multiple tumors, you treat one, both of them tend to resolve over time. And there was actually, in fact, one, one of the patients that was treated had multiple uh, uh, multifocal lesions. One of them was treated, and then all of them started to resolve over the course of a couple of months. So we, we think that histotripsy may have play a role in terms of either replacing or, or uh, sensitizing the tumor to the other treatments. And so sort of for our initial study, we, we just wanted to assess what happens to histotripsy to, to neuroblastoma tumors 
after this sort of mechanical ablation. And so in order to do this, uh, we're, Sonia has this great orthotopic um, uh, neuroblastoma model. So these, we basically inject um, uh, neuroblastoma cells into the kidney of the animal. Uh, they're luciferase expressing, meaning that um, you can visualize them under bioluminescence imaging. And so that's basically what we did. We, we used bioluminescence imaging to indicate the, the degree of tumor burden either prior to treatment, just after treatment, or, or one day later. And so, bio, so you're looking basically here at the, the intensity of the color scale. And so these are our initial results. So the, the higher the IVA signal, the higher the tumor burden, either just prior to, just after, or a day after treatment. Uh, this is, again, our initial results. So this is one, two, three, four, five animals. So you can see here for, for any individual animal, there's an initial decrease in the signal, followed by some degree of recovery a, a day later. Uh, if you sort of lump all these together and look at the signal relative to baseline, you can see that just after treatment, there's about a 50% reduction in the tumor burden, um, which I'm told is relatively good for this type of model, followed by, again, some, some degree of recovery. I should say that the just after is significantly reduced. Um, which is very nice, and actually this 24-hour this, um, mark also is, is significantly reduced to, to baseline. Um, so we're able to at least provide some tumor control um, in terms of the overall bulk and reduction of the, of the tumor. To get a better sort of assessment of what was happening you know, qualitatively, we did some histological analysis. So this is sort of a, a not a gross image, but an image of the entire tumor. Um, for a control animal. If you zoom in, the, the important thing here is that these, these tumors are really just densely packed cells. So it's cells on top of cells on top of cells. Um, for the uh, treated region, I, I like this image because you can actually still see the kidney uh, and the relative size of the tumor uh, compared to that. If you zoom in close to the ablation zone, uh, you, th you see things you expect. So because of the processing of these samples, um, you see this sort of um, these white regions which are consistent with, with liquefaction. So it's basically the liquefied portions of the tumor have been drawn out during the histology processing portion. So we're able to cause ablation, which I think is no surprise. What was interesting was these sort of like little blue marks right here um, that, that were present. So these were animals that were you know 24 hours after, after treatment. And so in this case, these we think based off the morphology and shape are actually the presence of neutrophils and natural killer cells. Now, this particular model is an immunocompromised model, meaning it, has, it should not have an immune response. But these would be like the equivalent of an immune response for this immunocompromised model. And so what that tells us is that we think that, you know, there's, there's a potential that histotripsy in these, neuro, these highly aggressive neuroblastoma tumors can induce some degree of an immune response that may synergize with sort of that last stage of, of treatment outcomes. So the, the other thing that was really interesting was the type of cell death that was initiated. So again, this is a, a tumor that was treated. Uh, in this case, we really only treated a sub-portion of the tumor um, for a couple of different regions. Again, you see these regions of ablation consistent with you know, intense bubble activity. Uh, complementary to that, we also performed tunnel staining. So tunnel is, an indicative, is indicative of apoptosis. It's sort of not a mechanical ablation, but sort of you're, you're causing the cells to commit suicide over time. And so anywhere you see this sort of copper color, you see, you see apoptosis. And you see a significant amount of apoptosis in regions where the, they have been treated, where the tumor has been treated. But what was interesting is that even distally to that, there were indications of apoptosis, meaning that there's some sort of global response of the tumor to cause most of the cells to try to start committing suicide. Um, more recently, we've collected some initial data that indicate that macrophages that are present in the tumor get sort of activated in, in lo close locality to these regions of high apoptosis to send out a cytokine to sort of spread throughout the tumor. So there, it, the point is that there's some, some interesting, really interesting stuff that happens to here. It's not necessarily in the ablation zone. It's everywhere else where it's that, that has not, uh, not been treated. So for instance, so again, this global apoptosis response. The other thing was the, was the, the vascular just outside the ablation zone. So again, so here you're looking at regions just outside the ablation zone. This is a control case. So the blue here is DAPI. That's a counter stain. That's just indicative of cells. Green is lectin, which is vessels. And then the copper, again, is apoptosis. So for the control cases, what you see is what I said earlier, just densely packed cells, essentially. In contrast, for the regions of the tumor that were just outside the ablation zone, you see this vast 
proliferation of the vasculature. So the vessels start to open up. And that seems to be somewhat concurrent also with, with uh, apoptosis. Now this is important because densely packed cells means that the chemotherapy is not going to be delivered very well. If you're able to do this, open up the vasculature, then it's going to allow the delivery of systemic therapies like chemotherapy and immunotherapy. The other thing that was interesting is, with this is concurrent with the opening of the vasculature was the changes in t tumor oxygenation. So this is a stain. Uh, the browner it is, the, it means the more that there is uh, hypoxia in the tumor. And so for the control cases, you see these dense regions associated with hypoxia, which you expect. If there's not a lot of vasculature, you expect to get a poor degree of oxygenation of the tumor. In contrast, for the histotrypti cases outside the ablation zone, there was no hypoxia observed. It was more of a, a normoxic response. Now, this is important because hypoxia is, is strongly correlated with tumor resistance to really any sort of treatment, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, radiation therapy. So the fact that we may be causing shifts in the tumor oxygenation is re really suggests that what we're going to be able to do is sensitize the tumor to all these different treatments. So we can, we can ablate as much as we can, and we can sensitize it, the residual disease to, to adjuvant therapy. So in summary, histotripsy is this mechanically ablative therapy. It uses bubble activity to, to really liquefy tissues to break them down. Um, we talked a little bit about imaging metrics because we want to try to improve upon this simple hyperechogenicity to try to develop something that's more quantitative to try to move in line with some sort of dosing scheme as well as um, improve, provide feedback for, for treatment efficacy. Uh, and then finally, we saw that the responsive tissue to histotripsy is that the cells are degraded. Um, the extracellular matrix is not degraded very well unless you use a, uh, an additional therapy in the case of, of um, venous thrombosis. And then it seems to cause structural changes in tissue oxygenation, vasculature, and um, overall cell death in the case of uh, at least that neuroblast tumor, neuroblastoma tumor model. Uh, so in terms of acknowledgments, of, of course, the lab has been I'm basically just a vehicle through which I, I convey their data. So this is really all, all um, thanks to them, uh, our funding sources over the years, and then our collaborators uh, in uh, the University of Washington, University of Cincinnati. So thank you, and I'll, I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, do we have questions? Yeah. Uh, is this able to work with tissue that's continually moving, like a lung? Oh, yeah. So lung's a no-no, unless it's on the surface. Um, uh, but, yeah, so there is so there is a couple different tech strategies that you can use to try to address uh, tissue moving under respiration. So... The robotic arm, for instance, we are trying to work right now to use some like computer vision techniques to adjust the position of the source to compensate for that. Um, you can also um, try to adjust your treatment zone so that it will, basically you treat everything you want to in a margin and sort of compensate for the, um, uh, compensate for respiration. You can also kind of change the shape of the ablation zone to, to address that also. Other questions? So for the histotripsy treatment for the cancer, uh, will the cancer cell uh, like uh, transfer to other location organs? That's the that's a question we always get. So so far it doesn't seem like that. So and I think it's mostly because the treatment is strongly restricted to in close proximity to the bubbles. The bubbles aren't necessarily like pushing them out of the way. It's sort of like the tissue stays intact, the bubbles expand. And they, they kill the cells. And I think some of it has to do with the time scale. But the, the time scale of bubble expansion is so fast, I don't think the sort of the you know, viscoelastic response of the tissue is sufficient to compensate to sort of knock it off. It just mostly stays in place. Thank you. Yeah. And I'll say also, like with the clotting uh, uh, samples also, all the debris that we see afterwards is subcellular inside. So it's, you're, you're not leaving like intact cells. Uh, so for that example, um, it was between 7 and 12 megahertz. 
if you find some hot spot I mean, during that venture signal, which one is probably the most effective? Yeah, so we're, we're in the process of trying to develop that right now. I have a, a student who's um, doing some estimates based off of, it basically has to do with what the effective bandwidth of the, of the imaging probe is. So you, you're, you want to try to develop a sequence that's effective, really both effectively in the fundamental and, and the uh, contrast specific, so you can still get good you know, anatomic imaging, but also at the same time good um, subharmonic signal. Um, so it, there is a, a trade-off there, um, but we're, we're hoping to, we've got a, it, the student did a really interesting like strange attractor based off of a plot of like contrast the tissue versus versus the bandwidth of the probe. So it, it, it is a complicated problem. And duration is about 20 microseconds, is that true? Um, it's shorter. So it's, I think we do about 20, 20 cycles of the, the center frequency. So I think it's around se seven microseconds. I have a question. Yeah. What's your model for going from the dissolution time to the energy imparted to the tissue? How do you, oh. I didn't catch that. Yeah, so it, it is, let's see, where is that? We're basically fitting this dissolution time because uh, you can you can use this model to this model basically recreates this dissolution profile and so we fit this I what we ended up doing is is, is linearizing it to the very early times in that case um, you can make some simplifications to this and essentially linearize it that's, that's a bubble that's a bubble model right that's yes that's a bubble a, model yeah one of the one of the many right? yes well it, it's it's the model based off of uh, Diffusion, so it's not it's not like a Rayleigh. It's plus not Rayleigh. Really yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, and then again, so how do you get to energy from there? Yeah, so you kind of you can back out uh, based off the scattering cross section for the intensity of the backscattered signal uh, yeah. to yeah. roughly like what the size. It's proportional so to it's, the size. So it's it's an equivalent. Uh, yeah, you're tra you're trying to take the grayscale and. Um, Based off the scattering cross section, you say like, okay, that that's kind of the size. There, there is a, like a lot of math associated with it, but it's, um, uh, yeah, it's kind of that's the, that's the, that's it in a nutshell. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It was a great talk, uh, and uh, I think we did. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being. Thanks for being an attentive audience. I'm going to ask for one more question about yeah, the, yeah. the probe. You said the 7 or 7 megahertz. Is that it's 7 to 12? 7 to 12. Is that the single, single crystal inside? No, so it's, it's, a, it's a linear probe that we're using. The, the array, right? Yes, yeah. But the element is a piezo base. Yes, yeah. Right? Did you provide the bulk wave? directly through the skin, or I'm mean, just thinking about the mode. Oh, are you talking about the, the therapy source or the imaging probe? The imaging probe. The imaging probe. Uh, I just think yes. about what kind of uh, disturbance that, you know, I mean. Oh, I don't, I mean, okay. for the ultrasound ones, it's usually, it, it is a good question, like in terms of radiation forces that doing something. We actually have some data that we um, think, um, uh, that the imaging pulses interact with the bubbles pretty aggressively, and so they can they can actually essentially the dissolution time. So um, yeah, in terms of the mode of the piezo, I would, it's, it's, it's probably like okay. a longitudinal. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, direct, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. So, in the we're going to have that 
pick up my kid, yeah. and the point is, you know, if you were to pick up the cooler, and drive you, drive you, yeah, okay, so maybe I can't take care of that, you know, my dad, and then, so we have, um, yeah, we have a question, yeah, there, so, because there's a room, will you reserve a room for you? Because there's, there's one room, one meeting, and one Okay. And, uh, and then, so you have made a little bit of a room. Yeah, right? Yeah, you were on your paper, yeah. Uh, because, yeah. 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 So, um, how um, how do you walk you to thirty two or nine? Okay. And then I'll get you this. Okay. Right. So it's I don't know if it makes sense, but it's the room where you have a Zoom meeting. Okay. So thirty two or nine, right? Over okay. Katarina. Okay. Sounds good. And so young, well, you know, or maybe you can figure it out. Uh, I mean that building. Is crazy. Uh, it, it makes no sense. The oh, room numbers. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, no, I, I cannot find it. <laughs> there's, no, there's no budget. There's okay. no, there's no, you know. It was just uh, a, ran, a random assortment of uh, Yeah, of yeah. room number, right? Yeah. So it's not that easy. Um, okay. So I'll meet you at 3209 at 1215-ish. Okay. And then we'll meet you in the lobby. Yeah, so that'll be great. Go lunch. A lobby yeah. at the very bottom, bottom one, or 41 bit in front of, I mean, and, yeah, that's easy. and if yeah. we're ready earlier, yeah, yeah. maybe we can go and you join us. Oh yeah, that's fine. Yeah, if my yeah. meeting happens, uh, I, yeah, it's, it's just I thought it's like twelve thirty, so I scared my. Uh, yeah, 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 sure. No, 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 that's fine. Okay. And I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't push it if I didn't have to leave. I would. So we're trying. We're trying yeah, yeah. Both, on both yeah. ends of lunch. Sure, sure, sure. So uh, if you want to go first, that's fine. I'll just follow. I'll, I'll send you an email okay. letting okay. you know what happens. Sure, sure. Thirty-two okay. nine twelve. Mm-hmm. Okay. And Army oh, can just yes. take this Thank to her now. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, thanks for your talk, Yeah, thanks for having me. I think we're being nice, but uh, yeah, but I can take you to my office and then you need to use the restroom and fetch up the grid. Sure. Sounds like a plan. Did you arrive yesterday? Yeah, I was. I got here. Not like five. Oh, that's not such a bad time. No. 